All right, you've all heard the expression, truth is stranger than fiction, and I think we all can see that that is the case. But here's something else that we should know, that fiction is truer than truth. When artists make a work, whether it's a story or a picture, a movie, a song, they reveal more about themselves and their moment in time than even they know. And when audiences flock to those works, it doesn't mean the work is good. It doesn't mean the work is enduring. It means the work is speaking into that moment in some way. It tells us something about the zeitgeist. That means the spirit of the age. Zeit means time, and geist is like ghost. It's the spirit, so it's the spirit of the time. This summer has seen two pop culture phenomena, the climax of Taylor Swift's era tours, which has broken all kinds of records, and the film Barbie, which has now made over a billion dollars worldwide. And the one thing we can say about both of these phenomena is that they are very girl. These are shows that are about girls, things that girls care about and think about, feelings and breakups and Barbie dolls, and what it feels like to be a woman. And never mind what the artists think they're saying, because they don't know. Never mind what our dishonest media on the left tell us they're saying, because we know what they're going to say. They're dishonest. And never mind what our clueless media on the right think they're saying, because they're clueless about culture. Today, I'm going to talk about what I think these phenomena are saying, because let's face it, that's what they're saying. You'll remember I recently said that I'd rather stick a screwdriver in my ear than go and see the Barbie movie just to show you how dedicated I am to finding the truth about our zeitgeist. I not only went, I went alone because my wife, knowing that I would rather die than go see a Barbie movie, had already made a date with her friends, her girlfriends, to go see Barbie, uh, which I couldn't blame her for. So I went alone and I... I couldn't, so I, you know, I couldn't even pretend that I was there. Oh, my wife dragged me. I couldn't even pretend that. So I kind of tried to sneak into the theater and so help me, I was recognized. <laughs> I was recognized in the elevator. No, no, no. I saw, I'm, I'm Matt Walsh. You're, you've got me confused with somebody else. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wow, that's stunning and brave. You are literally shaking at how stunning and brave I was to go to the Barbie movie by myself. But there were reasons that I was called to these heroic heights. First of all, uh, someone who actually knows something about the arts had to settle whether Shapiro or Knowles is right about the Barbie movie. Obviously, in any argument between Shapiro and Knowles, the odds that Shapiro is is more right than Knowles are so great that if you bet on Ben in Vegas you act, and win, you actually lose money. It's like betting on the sun coming up. But but both of these gentlemen, in my humble opinion, have deficits when it comes to looking at the culture. Ben has a wide scope of reading and movie watching. He's got excellent taste. But Ben cannot like something unless it is, he agrees with it. Ben cannot like a work of art unless he agrees with it. And that's not my feeling about art. People that I hate and disagree with deeply sometimes make beautiful visions. Art is a vision of what it's like for a human being to be in the world. And even though you are a leftist, even though you're a fool, you can make a beautiful vision. And then taking that in actually increases your own soul because it gives you another way to look at the world. As for Knowles, of course, uh, he doesn't like actually like art. He doesn't actually read fiction. Uh, he, he doesn't go to most of the movies that people see. And, of course, he's a fascistic papist uh, trying to undermine everything Americans hold dear and reinstall the Habsburgs on the throne of the Austrian Empire. So he just must be destroyed. I, who love all art and am pristinely perfect in my politics and morality, uh, went to see Barbie with a completely open mind, and I did settle definitively who is right about it, whether it is Shapiro or Knowles, and I will get to that. But the real reason that I was so self-sacrificing, stunning, and brave is this. I've said this before. I think it's absolutely true. Girls, right now, are at the hinge of human history. Now, none of you may be asking, why is a gray-bearded old guy going to talk about the summer of a girl? Now, normally, I don't address things like that because I think they are all left-wing ways of telling the right to shut up. When you say, oh, if you don't have a womb, you can't talk about abortion. What a stupid idea. If you're not black, you don't know the black experience. Utterly absurd. All just ways of shutting people up because the left has no arguments for their programs, which fail again and again and again because they don't match the real world. I have to say that I think I'm actually the best person to interpret the summer of girl because I don't care. I have no dog in this fight. I have the best wife in the world. I spent my entire life ignoring feminism. I never cared. I don't care what people do with their lives. I mean, it's, it's a blessing. It is a blessing. I am a natural libertarian. 
I don't care, you know, if there were, I, I see women making themselves incredibly miserable. I see men making themselves and women incredibly miserable. I wish they would stop doing that. I love them. I want them to be happy, but I know I only have a certain amount of power. And so I look at this and I just want to know, because I'm a culture maven, I want to know what the culture is telling me about the zeitgeist, okay? I was fascinated by the phenomenon of the Taylor Swift tour. This is probably the highest grossing tour of all time. Uh, Tay-Tay has got the most number one records by a woman, uh, most stream records in a day. She's huge. And I want to know why, because I look at her, look, I, I'm not going to knock her because I don't really know, I don't really care that much about popular music. I don't like it that much. I don't listen to it that much. I'm no judge of it. But she, she does seem to me talented, right? She, she seems, I can't really judge the music, but her lyrics are well-written and they're good in a different, few different genres, pop, basic, basically pop and country. Uh, and, and I like her lyrics, you know, that song, We're Never Getting Back Together is, it, I heard the critics say, oh, these, these are not as good as her usual lyrics. That's wrong. <laughs> Those are good. Just the use of the word exhausting in the song is well, it's well heard. You know, I can tell when a writer is doing well, Teardrops on My Guitar is a great title for a country song. She is good. And of course, she's very pretty and she has a nice voice and apparently does a great show, though I can't judge that either. So I have nothing against her, but why she should be such a huge phenomenon, a phenomenon, I, I, wanted to know, right? So I spent the last couple of weeks listening to her music and watching some concert footage and watching her documentary, Miss Americana. So I know it's stunning and brave, right? You're trembling with how stunning and brave you are. And, and by the way, I also can see, I can see that little girls love her and older women who are in touch with their little girl selves love her and little gay guys love her. And they all go to this concert and they cry and they're overwhelmed and they go, uh, they make it a pilgrimage. And, and she seems to be very nice to her fans, which I also admire because it's hard. And I don't want to overanalyze her line by line. I could do that, but I don't want to take her songs apart line by line. I just want to notice that she is very girl. Her songs are always about Two things. There are two things that they're about. They're about relationships. You know, I want to be with you, but you're with somebody else, or I am with you and it's a fairy tale, or uh, we broke up and I'm sad. They're about relationships, or they're about people are saying this about me, but it's just not true, I, or I don't care. One of the others is, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be put in any, you're not going to tell me who I am. And she talks about this a lot in her documentary, Miss Americana. She talks about the fact, which any performer could talk about, that she is desperate to be loved, and she wants to be seen as good, and she finds this oppressive, that this is what she wants, and she gets very upset when the fans don't like her. The documentary is kind of funny because, like all girls, she has to tell a story of triumph over adversity, but, you know, she's been famous and successful since she was 17, so adversity for her is, you know, when Kanye West's fans don't like her, that's a adversity for her, but all God's people have problems, and so, you know, I'm, I'm not knocking her. I'm just saying it was kind of kind of cute that that was what her idea of adversity was. But when you live for approval and you think that people are condemning you, you have to do one of two things, right? You either have to change and fulfill the expectations of the people who are condemning you, or you have to philosophically dismiss the categories by which you're condemned. And that's the way feminism works, Okay. Basically, feminism says these values that they're condemning us on are social constructs. It's not bad to be fat. It's not bad to be a bitch. You know, this is just things that people say about women, but they're not bad. And that is how Taylor Swift ends Miss Americana. By the end of it, this is what she is saying. It's cut nine. I'm trying to be as educated as possible on how to respect people, on how to deprogram the misogyny in my own brain toss it out, reject it, and resist it. Like, there is no such thing as a slut. There is no such thing as a bitch. There is no such thing as someone who's bossy. There's just a boss. We don't want to be condemned for being multifaceted. <laughs> okay, now, of course, every word she just says is untrue, and it's at the heart of feminism, which is we are forced Women are forced to be the way they are. My problems as a woman are the problems foisted upon me by social construct. And she's wrong. There is such a thing as a bitch, and it's a nasty, lousy thing to be. Uh, bossiness is unattractive in women, more unattractive in women than it is in men, and that makes it ineffective, by the way. And by the way, I've had men and women bosses work with them perfectly happily. happily. If you ask me to, to generalize, I would say the men are better bosses than the women. 
But it's never bothered me because I know I'm going to do my job as well as I can and as honestly as I can, no matter who's in charge. So it doesn't really bother me, you know, who, who is the boss. And being a slut is degrading. It is a degrading thing to be, much more so for a woman than for a man, because First of all, simply the act of being entered is more profound and personal than the act of entering. That's one thing. But also, in order to be a slut, you either have to kill the babies you saw, you uh, create by mistake, or you have to become a sterile cyborg through the use of birth control. And women are catching on to this. Women are catching on to the fact that essentially birth control defines them out of existence. Here is another Taylor, because all women are now named Taylor, comedian Taylor Tomlinson. Tomlinson. And I've watched a lot of her stuff, and she's not that funny because she's a woman, but, but she is a thoughtful, intelligent person. And this is what she says in one of her uh, stand-up routines, Cut 10. I'd love to get off birth control because I'd love to meet me, you know? <laughs> I've heard that when you get off birth control, you're just like, has anyone in here gotten off of birth control? You have right here. Oh, a lot of us. Okay. All right. How did that go for you? I broke up with my boyfriend. Of six you broke up with your boyfriend of six years. <laughs> These are the stories I'm talking about. <laughs> this is what I've heard about. You stop. You stop getting doing birth control, and you don't. Your sense of smell changes. Your sense of smell you changes. Get by then. Oh my God. So wait, what did your what did your ex boyfriend smell like before when you were on birth control, and what did he smell like once you got off birth control? You're like when I was on birth control he smelled like my future and when I got off he smelled like the past yeah you bet he did you bet he did because suddenly you became yourself which is a woman with a creative body with a fertile body that produces images of God when it after it has sex my underlying point is this this lie of feminism which Taylor Swift is expressing is is that it is a social construct that women are completed by someone looking at them that is not true. This is the thing you are not allowed to say. Women have to be completed by someone else. And they hate this about themselves because it means someone is going to have control over them. That is inbuilt. Women, that's never going to change. Women's souls are built like their bodies with a center that has to be filled in order to be creative. Society doesn't do that. That is part of of life. And this is what Andrew Tate understands. This is how he manipulates and controls women by using this fact that feminists deny so that, that men feel like a wimp and they say, oh, Andrew Tate knows how it's done. But no, he's abusing, he's abusing people because of the way they are, but it still is at the heart of who a woman is. Have you ever noticed that when boys play with Superman dolls, they don't grow up and say, oh, I couldn't live up to Superman. I couldn't fly around and be muscular. They don't say it. They don't say it. They don't need to be completed by the doll. They were just playing. They were pretending, imagining to be Superman. But that's not true when it comes to Barbie, which brings me to Barbie, which is a talented artist's attempt to make a very big statement about being a woman. And, and here are we, we have to turn to find out if it's good to two men because only conservative men can judge uh, a movie about women. So let's go first to Ben Shapiro. This movie is not just a piece of shit. This movie is a flaming piece of dog shit piled atop an entire dumpster on fire, piled atop a landfill filled with dog shit. So the basic idea of the film, they, they really have no basic idea of the film. They don't know whether they hate Barbie or they we're supposed to kind of like Barbie. It, it, it seems they kind of despise Barbie as a fascist emblem, as we'll get to. The basic sort of premise of the film, politically speaking, is that men and women are on two sides of the divide and they, and they hate each other. And literally the only way you can have a happy world is if the women ignore the men and the men ignore the women. That seems to be the, the final outcome of this film. I was trying to separate this into problems with plot and problems with character and problems with, with the politics of the film, but they're all intertwined because the thing is just a mess. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> all right. That was Ben's, you know, subtle, you know, nuanced opinion. Uh, and then, of course, there was Michael Knowles who said this, cut 13. It's great. It's great. I was primed to like it because, one, uh, it's always fun to disagree with Ben, but, uh, you know, sometimes Ben and I agree. And two, because Greta Gerwig did a great job with Lady Bird, her movie that came out in 2017, I thought was really, really excellent. So I already had this sense that Greta Gerwig is not some just crazy radical who gets everything wrong. Lady Bird was a very conservative movie. And so I, I watched it. Guys, from the very beginning, it's not even particularly ambiguous that Barbie is a conservative movie. The, the short version of it is it opens up 
with this, this homage to 2001 A Space Odyssey. And it's these little girls playing with their baby dolls, and they're having a nice time. Then Barbie comes in as this icon of feminist progress, and the girls start killing their babies, which if that doesn't sum up feminism, I don't know what does. <laughs> All right. Who is right? Simple, definitive answer. Knowles is completely wrong. And Ben, Ben is exaggerating. He likes to exaggerate. The picture is not awful. The picture, it's really not an awful movie, but it's slow and it's, it's not very good. And it's, and it's, it lectures you endlessly. It's not that funny. Uh, the, the sets are great, obviously. It's, and it's dishonest about the world, what the world actually looks like and how the world actually works. And Ben is especially right about this. It makes no sense. It's artistically incoherent. And if it weren't, it, you know, the tagline for the movie when they sold it in the trailers was, if you hate Barbie, you'll love this film. And if you love Barbie, you'll love this film. Well, that's a film without vision. That's like my saying, if you hate Hitler, you'll love this movement. But if you love Hitler, you'll also love this movement. No, you gotta, one or the other has to be the case. Ben is very right. The film makes no sense. And the reason people flock to it is because at its heart, its dishonesty is very girly. Tell me I don't look fat in this dress. Lie to me because I need to see me in a certain way. At the heart of the film is the lie, the feminist lie, that what women are lacking is power. That's what they need is power. And power is the thing they need. And society, social constructs, bar their path to that power. In the matriarchy of Barbie, Barbie starts in this matriarchy where everybody, Barbie holds all the political offices, does all the jobs, she's all the doctors, all that stuff. Ken is essentially a woman. Ken lives to be seen by Barbie. And that's a way that Greta Gerwig is saying that women have been put into this position where they can only be completed by being seen. They have an emptiness that needs to be filled because they haven't got power they haven't got power, so they need to be seen. And if we could just reverse the societal roles, then women would not have that problem. That's a lie. This is the way women are made. Women are made with an emptiness that needs to be filled, and that bothers them because it means that they need a man in their life, and that if they don't have that man in their life, they're going to get something else to fill that space, and it's going to be Andrew Tate or something else that's unhealthy. There's a now celebrated speech uh, delivered by America Ferrara in, in this show. And it, it's, it's really interesting because none of the philosophy, people say all kinds of different things. Men hate women and women hate women. A mother stands still so that her daughter can look back and see how far she's gone. That, that's a stupid saying. That sounds like a Hallmark card, but that's a stupid thing to say. And then there's this speech, which everybody is quoting, cut 11, cut 11 yeah. It is literally impossible to be a woman. You are so beautiful and so smart, and it kills me that you don't think you're good enough. Like, we have to always be extraordinary, but somehow we're always doing it wrong. <laughs> like you have to be thin, but not too thin. And you can never say you want to be thin. You have to say you want to be healthy, but also you have to be thin. <laughs> You have to have money, but you can't ask for money because that's crass. You have to be a boss, but you can't be mean. You have to lead, but you can't squash other people's ideas. You're supposed to love being a mother, but don't talk about your kids all the damn time. You have to be a career woman, but also always be looking out for other people. You have to answer for men's bad behavior, which is insane. But if you point that out, you're accused of complaining. Now, all of that in this speech is ultimately blamed on patriarchy. But patriarchy created none of those problems. Patriarchy doesn't care whether women make money. Patriarchy doesn't care whether women are in the workplace. Patriarchy values women as homemakers and mothers. It doesn't want them to be obsessed with power. It doesn't expect them to be a boss, but be nice. It expects them to just be nice. We don't care whether women are bosses. That's why the movie makes no sense. It can't admit that the problem is feminism. It can't admit that it is impossible to be both a feminist and to be a feminine person, because the problem with feminism is that it is male. It is It elevates male values namely power, centrally power. Femininity is not about power, it's about creation. And this is why Knowles makes a mistake. He doesn't, he's not reading the movie right. He is 
right that in this incohate, incoherent stuff, there is a lot of stuff praising motherhood and elevating motherhood because Greta Gerwig is an artist and she does know that motherhood is at the center of womanhood, but she can't say that because then she's not a feminist and then she won't get the reviews and the billions of dollars that she is getting for this picture. Power is all feminists think about. It's all the Barbie movie talks about. And women can't figure out why that doesn't work for them, why they kept keep ending up being used and abused. Why is Me Too still a thing? It comes into the news for a little while and then it goes away because the men aren't paying attention to it. And why is it that women who are powerful wind up with men who abuse them? This happens again and again. It happened to Simone de Beauvoir, one of the first feminists. She was out with the Jean-Paul Sartre who treated her like crap and she said, I can't help it. This is what I want. This is what she said. And the reason that power does not work as a feminine value is because women are inherently physically from birth about creation. And here's the kicker. Creation is the opposite of power. A human body, think of a human body like an instrument. I'm going to drive this metaphor right into the ground, but there's a, there are only two kinds of instruments. There's a male instrument and the female instrument. We all have male and female in our souls. All of us. We all have parts of us that could be called male or female, but we play our souls into the world on the instrument of our body, right? I'm beating this metaphor in the ground. A harp can't play the trumpet part. A trumpet can't play the harp part. And you can't turn a harp into a trumpet. You play your soul on the instrument you have, which is the instrument of your gender. And there are only two of them. And just like an instrument, your body has a range of things it can express and a range of things it can't go. Women have creative bodies and creativity is not an act of power. It's an act of surrender. Every artist knows this. Every artist knows you don't make the things you make. You submit to the things you make. You let the inspiration come in and you are forced to bring it out again. And that describes pregnancy too. Creativity is an act of surrender. And women in creating surrender themselves to a man. And they're created to do that. That's why they need to be seen. That's why they need to be completed. And you can be seen by Andrew Tate, who hates you. You can be seen by your boss, who doesn't give a damn about you. You can be seen by the feminist, who will lie to you. Or you can be seen by a man who loves you and cares for you. Ben is right about this, too, in the picture. The movie ends with Ken saying, oh, I should just be Ken, and Barbie should just be Barbie. And that sounds really inspiring. Just be yourself. It's nihilistic death, just like abortion is, just like living on birth control. We women and men are made for one another. We are made to come together at the center of the human experience and create life and become one flesh. And we can't do that by denying the existence of femininity, and we shouldn't do it through abuse and domination like the Andrew Tates of this world. I cannot believe anybody elevates that pimp. It's a, a disgusting. You know how we do it. You know the only way to do it right, and that's through love. It's simple, but it's hard. You do it in kindness and gentleness and sacrifice. We give up things we want for one another in order to be with one another, in order to be part of one another. And we make life, and in making life, we become one flesh. And that's how a man and a woman become one flesh flesh. That's true surrender, not getting pimped, not getting impregnated and dumped, becoming one flesh, the center of life. And if the center doesn't hold, it doesn't matter who wins the next election, because if we can't build a protected center in which a woman and a man can dwell together and become one flesh and create new life, we won't just lose our freedom, we'll lose our humanity, which is the living image of God. And that image comes into material existence at the origin of the world. God, I love that guy, don't you? If you do, like and subscribe. Also, subscribe to The Andrew Clavin Show wherever you get your podcasts.